Hey guys, today we're going to be learning about how to get big and how to get small. Particularly, we're going to talk about muscle hypertrophy and muscle atrophy. There are three muscle types, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. Skeletal muscle is what you use whenever you purposefully move your body, like in walking. Smooth muscles are controlled involuntarily and form the walls of hollow organs like your digestive tract or your arteries. Cardiac muscle is also controlled involuntarily, and that's what makes up your heart. Smooth and cardiac muscles take care of themselves through your autonomic nervous system to perform their basic functions, but in this video we will be focused on skeletal muscle, which you control. Skeletal muscles are composed of tons of muscle cells that take the form of long fibers. These fibers are made up of bunches of myofibrils. Inside all the myofibrils we find sarcomeres, which are what allow these muscles to perform their basic function, to contract and relax. Thick filaments composed of myosin motor proteins use ATP to tug on thin filaments composed of actin protein. This action pulls the overlapping filaments against each other and shortens the muscle fibers, contracting the muscle. Muscular atrophy or muscle wasting is a common occurrence characterized by a loss of muscle tissue. This condition causes muscles to appear smaller than usual. It typically results from lack of muscle stimulation and can be reversed through improved exercise and dietary habits. Muscle atrophy is very common and is caused by a variety of factors, so most individuals experience it at some point in their lifetime, especially as they age. Muscular atrophy has a variety of pathological causes as well. Poor nutrition can prevent muscles from growing, and muscular atrophy can develop due to poor diet choices or conditions that result in malnutrition. Muscular atrophy also naturally occurs with age, which is called sarcopenia. Spinal muscle atrophy, the second most common autosomal recessive disorder behind cystic fibrosis, is an example of muscular atrophy that is onset through genetic mutations. Medical conditions and neurological problems affecting nervous stimulation of muscle fibers also inherently result in their subsequent degradation. Muscular atrophy often results in muscle weakness that impedes coordination, making balancing, walking, speaking, and swallowing difficult. A noticeable characteristic of muscular atrophy is that in isolated cases, it can cause one limb to appear significantly smaller than the other, like if you had one leg in a boot and were on crutches for a long time. Even astronauts experience muscular atrophy, as they don't need to use their muscles very much without gravity up in space. In just 10 days, astronauts can lose up to 20% of their muscle mass. Imagine how the long-term space station residents feel about that. They have to exercise two and a half hours every day using special equipment in order to maintain their muscle mass and strength. Atrophy is mainly dictated by the shift towards muscle protein degradation and away from muscle protein synthesis. In fact, the amount of muscle mass in any given person is determined by the ratio of protein synthesis to protein degradation. Two main pathways cause the degradation of muscle protein in skeletal muscle, and when upregulated, result in atrophy. Those two pathways are the ubiquitin proteasome system and the autophagy lysosome system. When three ubiquitin molecules are conjugated to a ubiquitin ligase called E3, it can then bind to the proteasome to cause protein degradation. The library of E3 enzymes is quite extensive and not fully established yet. However, it has been established that atrogen 1, MUFR1, and FBXO40 are specific E3 proteins that are responsible for the regulation of crucial muscle protein synthesis pathway components shown on the slide. Stimulation of the expression of these proteins through a lack of muscle use leads to increased protein degradation and thus atrophy. Additionally, the autophagy lysosome system contributes to the degradation of proteins and the removal of organelles from muscle cells. Removal of organelles prevents the cells from having sufficient machinery for survival, thus causing a decrease in cellular size. This pathway is upregulated by fasting for prolonged periods of time, starvation, and by growth factor deprivation. Thus, starving oneself for prolonged periods of time can induce atrophy. As you can clearly see in the diagram to the right, there are many complex signaling pathways involved in atrophy. However, in this video, we will primarily focus on the stimulation of the IGF-1, AKT, FOXO, and the myostatin pathways. The secretion of IGF-1 plays a crucial role in the regulation of the balance of muscle protein synthesis and degradation. In terms of stimulating atrophy, a lack of IGF-1 can prevent the phosphorylation of AKT and thus prevent the inhibition of FOXO transcription factors, which allow for the transcription of protein degradation genes, which ultimately cause an increased protein degradation in muscle atrophy. Recalling that growth hormone stimulates the secretion of IGF-1 from the liver, it becomes clear how damage to the pituitary gland or hypothalamus could cause muscle atrophy. 
Myostatin is a member of the transforming growth factor beta family. Its main role is to increase protein degradation via blockage of the IGF-1 PI3K AKT pathway and activation of FOXO1, which allows for the transcription of atrogen-1. Further, myostatins in association with SMAD2 and 3 have shown an inhibitory effect on the mTOR pathway, which plays a significant role in muscle hypertrophy and protein synthesis. Subsequently, mutations that cause upregulation of myostatin typically result in muscle atrophy diseases. Muscle hypertrophy is when the muscle mass and cross-sectional area increase. The cylinder to the right represents a muscle before hypertrophy. It swells, and then it has experienced hypertrophy. Hypertrophy can occur from exercise where the muscle grows in parallel or sometimes from adaption where it grows in series. Adaption is usually the result of an injury. For example, a muscle in a cast needing to adapt to new lengths. We will focus mainly on exercise. We will now go over the main mechanisms of muscle hypertrophy. First is an increase in myofibrils. The rate of muscle contractile protein synthesis is greater than decay, leading to more actin and myosin filaments in the myofibrils. Myofibrils within the muscle fiber split, resulting in more myofibrils in each muscle fiber. This is not an increase in muscle fibers themselves, rather just myofibrils. Another type of hypertrophy is when additional sacromeres are added to the end of muscle fibers. This normally happens when the muscle has to adapt to a new functional length. This kind of addition is in series. This flowchart shows the pathway from exercise to hypertrophy. When someone exercises, there's an increase in the size and number of actin and myosin, and an increase in the total number of sacromeres in parallel. This, therefore, increases the diameter of the muscle fiber, which increases the muscle cross-sectional area also known as hypertrophy. When muscles need to grow, they have to make new cells. The main issue is that muscle cells don't necessarily have all the parts they need to form a wholly new muscle cell. So this is where satellite cells come in. Satellite cells are cells that surround skeletal muscles throughout the body. When these muscles need to grow, the satellite cells donate nuclei that allow new muscle cells to be formed. There are three main factors that cause muscle hypertrophy or growth. The primary factor is mechanical tension generated by using that muscle. This mechanical tension activates the mTOR pathway, which encourages muscle growth. The remaining two factors are much more minor. Muscle damage, or disturbing the muscle integrity, causes downstream signaling along the AKT slash mTOR pathway and promotes the release of growth factors and thus muscle growth. Metabolic stress is the result of using muscles without available oxygen. This causes a buildup of certain things in your blood, metabolites, that encourage cell swelling, hormonal changes, and growth factor build. Maintaining skeletal muscle mass is done by regulating the balance between anabolic and catabolic processes. mTOR, or the mammalian target for rapamycin, controls these signaling pathways and is vital for muscle hypertrophy. But what regulates mTOR? IGF-1 promotes muscle hypertrophy by initiating the mTOR pathways for protein synthesis, and myostatin inhibits it by regulating the number of muscle fibers that can be made during development. Because muscle atrophy and hypertrophy are regulated by the same mechanisms, we can stimulate hypertrophy in order to treat atrophy. A study done in college-aged males showed that blocking myostatin binding resulted in an increase in muscle growth, and in fact, myostatin inhibitors are banned in competition. This treatment can also apply to clinical settings as well. Patients with Becker muscular dystrophy found improved muscular function when injected with myostatin inhibitors. Here we will go through an example of ACL surgery recovery to see the process of atrophy to hypertrophy, start to finish. The disease is a torn ACL that's been replaced by a patella graft surgery. This means part of the patella tendon was stripped and used to replace the ACL. The cause of this cycle is the patient's inability to properly use their legs and possible nerve damage from a nerve block used in surgery. The effect is protein degradation exceeding protein synthesis so that upregulation of ubiquitin protozoan system and autophagy lysosome system. As previously discussed, this results in muscle atrophy. In this case, specifically the quadricep muscle will experience extreme atrophy. This is treated with physical therapy and electrode stimulation. While the patient exercises in physical therapy, they have electrodes attached to their quadricep sending signals to the muscle. 
The effect of the electrodes is stimulation of sensory neurons. As mentioned, nerve blocks can inhibit activity. The electrodes stimulate that activity by activating quadriceps sensory neurons to send signals to the brain. The brain responds by sending signals back to the quadricep via motor neurons initiating a muscle contraction. The effect of exercise, as previously mentioned, is muscular tension, which will promote protein synthesis to exceed degradation. Initiating neural stimulus and increasing protein synthesis then results in muscle hypertrophy. Treatment options outside of electrode stimulation are currently being tested. Low intensity focused ultrasound promotes the creation of new blood vessels, which in turn bring nutrients and growth factors to atrophied muscle and promote hypertrophy. Drugs like cyclooxygenase 2 seek to promote prostaglandin synthesis, a type of protein that encourages the expansion of muscle specific stem cells. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed learning about muscle atrophy and hypertrophy with us today.